Thanks for that generous introduction, Dean Zaheer. I spent many happy years here at the University of Minnesota as a teacher and a researcher, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to turn, turn home, as it were. Um, one of my jobs as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is to help in the formulation of monetary policy. The Federal Open Market Committee meets eight times per year to set the path of monetary policy over the next six to seven weeks. All 12 presidents of the various regional Federal Reserve Banks, including me, and the seven governors of the Federal Reserve Board, including Chairman Bernanke, contribute to these deliberations. Now, I said there were seven governors. Actually, right now, there are only five governors because there are two unfilled positions. With that said, the Federal Open Market Committee itself consists only of the governors, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and a group of four other presidents that rotates annually. And right now, those four other presidents are the presidents of Minneapolis, Philadelphia, Dallas, and Chicago. But next year, it'll change to a new group of four. Now, as I said, this committee meets eight times per year. And its deliberations concern the appropriate readjustment of monetary policy to the new information received since the last meeting. But the committee has to keep in mind its medium-term and long-term goals when making these readjustments. And it must also keep in mind the public's understanding of these goals. This perspective that good policy responds to the current conditions so as to achieve certain well-communicated future goals will be a key theme for the remainder of my remarks. And they'll be divided into three parts. The first part is about the FOMC's objectives and my thoughts regarding them. In the second part, I discuss the FOMC's performance relative to those goals in the past three and a half years since the beginning of the Great Recession. Finally, I close with a analysis of recent FOMC decision making. And here my discussion is perhaps a little more disengaged than usual since I dissented from, that is formally disagreed with, the last FOMC decision. Here it seems especially apropos to remind you that my remarks here today reflect my thoughts alone and not necessarily those of others in the Federal Reserve System, including my colleagues in the Federal Open Market Committee. So you, you'll have to excuse me, at times I might be speaking very rapidly, but I've been told I have to stop at 12.45 on the dot, so. And as a you know, former professor, I know the importance of keeping that deadline of when we end, so. <clears throat> so uh, let me talk first about FOMC objectives. So Congress has mandated that the Federal Reserve set monetary policy so as to promote price stability and maximum employment. In my view, the heart of implementing the price stability mandate is to formulate and communicate an objective for inflation. The central bank then fulfills its price stability mandate by making choices over time so as to keep inflation close to that announced objective. Now, this job is not an easy one. The central bank's job is complicated by economic shocks that may lower or raise inflationary pressures. The central bank provides monetary accommodation, for example, lower interest rates, in response to shocks that push down on inflation. It reduces accommodation in response to shocks to push up on inflation. In this way, it works to ensure that inflation does indeed stay close to its announced objective. As I've said, though, it's not enough to have an objective. The Federal Reserve must also communicate that objective clearly. And it's that communication that serves to anchor medium-term and long-term inflationary expectations. Put another way, without clear communication of objectives, the public can only guess at the intentions of the FOMC. Inflationary expectations and inflation itself will inevitably end up fluctuating, and possibly by a lot. As I'll discuss later, it is possible to undo these shifts in expectations, but only at significant economic cost. Now, the Federal Reserve communicates its objective for inflation in a number of ways. For example, at quarterly intervals, FOMC meeting participants 
publicly reveal their forecast for inflation five, uh, for inflation five years hence, assuming that monetary policy is optimal. Now, those forecasts usually range between 1.5% and 2% per year. They're often collectively referred to as uh, by saying that the Federal Reserve views inflation as being, quote unquote, mandate consistent. That's the Fed language that I've, I've learned over the last two years. Inflation is mandate consistent if it is running at 2% or a bit under. But the Fed has also communicated its intentions more directly and more broadly. Last December, for example, on the television program 60 Minutes, Chairman Bernanke explained the dangers of letting inflation fall too low relative to this 2% or a bit under range. In the same interview, he also emphasized that the FOMC is unwilling to allow inflation to rise above this range. Now, as I'll describe in more detail later in my speech, the economy was hit in the past three and a half years by shocks that had the potential to drive inflation uh, significantly downward. I believe that the FOMC's clear communication of its inflation objective has helped the FOMC keep inflation from falling too low in the face of those shocks. At the same time, clear communication of its objective has also allowed the FOMC to follow highly accommodated monetary policies, like keeping interest rates near zero for nearly three years, without triggering large upward movements in inflationary expectations. I've been emphasizing the importance of communication, and communication matters greatly. But ultimately, the public's beliefs about the, the FOMC's inflation objective will also depend on inflationary outcomes. If annual inflation averages less than 1.5% for more than three or four years, onlookers will begin to suspect the FOMC's true objective is lower than its declaration of 2% or a bit under. Correspondingly, if inflation is persistently higher than 2%, then the public will begin to believe that the FOMC's true objective for inflation is higher than 2%. In either case, inflation expectations could become unmoored, and the FOMC could lose control of inflation itself. Communication can only be effective if the FOMC also retains credibility. Now, as I mentioned, Congress has also mandated that the FOMC set monetary policy so as to promote maximum employment. Now, in the past, some have seen an intrinsic conflict between the FOMC's price stability mandate and its maximum employment mandate. In contrast, my thinking accords with the more modern viewpoint that there is relatively little tension between these two goals. The modern paradigm recognizes that monetary policy should allow the natural supply and demand forces in the economy to operate without impediment. For example, if energy costs spike, the basic forces of supply and demand dictate that firms will cut back in production and demand less labor, creating higher unemployment. It is inefficient for any policy, including monetary policy, to attempt to interfere with this natural adjustment process. It follows that the Federal Reserve's operational definition of maximum employment has to vary over time. Now, nonetheless, the modern paradigm does view price stability as playing a crucial role in ensuring maximum employment. It is well documented that fir different firms adjust their prices Excuse me. It is well documented that different firms adjust their prices at different times and in different ways in response to the ebb and flow of inflationary pressures in the economy. This asynchronous adjustment of prices across firms generates economic inefficiencies, including losses of employment. By ensuring that prices follow a steady, well-understood path, the Federal Reserve eliminates the variation in inflationary pressures and the need for firms to respond to that variation. In this way, the Federal Reserve's mission of achieving price stability is entirely consistent with its mission of achieving maximum employment. But there is another deeper sense 
in which the price stability and maximum employment mandates are intertwined. Imagine that inflation runs at 3 to 4% for three, for three or four years. The public will then start to doubt the credibility of the Fed's stated commitment to 2% or a bit under. The public's medium-term inflationary expectations will consequently begin to rise. As we saw in the latter part of the 1970s, these changes in expectations can serve to reinforce and augment the upward drift in inflation. At that point, the Federal Reserve will have to tighten policy considerably if it wishes to regain control of inflation. But we learned in the 1980s that the resultant tightening, while necessary, generates large losses in employment. In other words, failing to meet its price stability mandate can also lead the FOMC over the medium and long term to substantial failure on its employment mandate. Now, an important communications challenge for the FOMC is that it is much harder to quantify the maximum employment mandate than the price stability mandate. I've already talked about how a change in energy costs can push down on maximum employment. But changes in minimum wage policy, demography, taxes and regulation, technological productivity, job market efficiency, unemployment insurance benefits, entrepreneurial credit access, and social norms, this is a partial list, all influence what we might consider maximum employment. Trying to offset the changes in, uh, these changes in the economy with monetary policy can lead to a dangerous shift in inflation expectations and ultimately inflation itself. So uh, that's my, my summary about uh, the FOMC's objectives and my, my perspectives on them. The FOMC has a price stability mandate and a maximum employment mandate uh, the price stability mandate is, is well communicated to involve an uh, uh, objective of, two, of inflation at 2% or a bit under. And I've talked about how the meeting the price stability mandate uh, is actually part of ensuring maximum employment. And there's no intrinsic conflict between the two mandates. Now I want to move on to talk about monetary policy since the, since the Great Recession and to what extent the Federal Reserve has been able to, to uh, achieve uh, its price stability mandate. So as I discussed earlier, the Fed is mandated to, 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 to promote price stability. And the question I want to ask now is, how has the Federal Reserve done in terms of its price stability mandate since the Great Recession began? And that was in December of 2007. And the answer is remarkably well. The personal consumption expenditure, PCE inflation rate, has averaged 1.8% per year from the fourth quarter of 2007 to the second quarter of 2011. I would say that this outcome is essentially consistent with price stability, as I talked about, 2% or a bit under. Now, this admiral performance is not due to luck. Since mid-2006, residential land prices have fallen by over 50%. Falling land prices were at the heart of the financial crises from 2007 to 2009 and have generated a persistent fall in wealth and borrowing capacity for households. The associated declines in demand for consumption goods and investment goods push downward on prices and inflation. Confronted with this enormous shock to the economy, the Federal Reserve has followed an unprecedentedly and imaginably accommodative policy. It has kept interest rates near zero for, for, as I talked about, since December 2008. It has provided what's called forward guidance by explicitly expressing its expectation that interest rates, interest rates would stay extraordinarily low for an extended period. It has bought over $2 trillion of longer-term government and government-backed securities. Through these actions, the Fed has provided an extraordinary amount of monetary stimulus and so has been able to meet its price stability mandate. Now what about the future, though? There are a number of ways to measure expectations of inflation, and they all, unfortunately, come with caveats. Last December, a Cleveland Fed study analyzed several such measures and concluded that the survey of professional forecasters uh, projections, the SPF, this is a, 
uh, survey that's done by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Um, the Cleveland Fed study concluded that the SPF tended to forecast inflation relatively well. Now, the most recent SPF survey conducted before the August FOMC meeting predicted that PC inflation would average 2.1% per year over the next five years, which again, I, I would say is essentially consistent with our price stability mandate. Thus, in the face of challenging circumstances, the Federal Reserve has met its price stability mandate and is expected to continue to do so. Unemployment does remain disturbingly high. Yet I'm sure that it would be even higher without the enormous amount of monetary stimulus that the FOMC has provided. Moreover, I believe the FOMC could have only have systematically to lower the unemployment rate further by generating inflation rates higher than 2% over a multi-year period. Such an outcome could well lead the public to lose faith in the credibility of the FOMC's inflation objective and thereby increase the probability that the FOMC would lose control of inflation. As I stressed earlier, this scenario would require a policy response, a policy response that would itself involve substantial losses of employment. So that's a quick look back at what's happened uh, since December 2007 in terms of the price stability mandate. And the basic message is that inflation has pretty much tracked 2%, 1.8% or a bit under, and then the expectations going forward are also to track 2%. So from that point of view, um, despite enormous sh uh, disinflationary uh, di shocks that we normally would consider disinflationary, the FOMC has been able to keep um, inflation at, 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 at close to 2% or a bit under. Now much of my discussion so far has been a look back over the past three and a half years as I just talked through. Now I'd like to turn to my assessment of the most recent round of FOMC decision making. Now to put this part of my talk in the proper context, I want to ask another key question. How did the FOMC achieve its success over the past three and a half years with regard to price stability? The answer, I believe, is that the FOMC consistently made choices in response to short-term conditions, short-term economic conditions, that were designed to support its medium-term objectives. Now, getting these choices right is certainly more of an art than a science. With that said, economists have suggested a number of rules that tell central banks how to respond to changes in economic conditions so as to keep inflation near some target level. I generally find these rules useful in guiding policymaking, and it's especially so when they arrive at the same recommendation. Now, these different rules come from different economists. Sometimes they come from the same economists at different points in their career, so they don't always make the same recommendation as a result. So, but when they do come to the same recommendation, I, th I, I think they are useful. So here's an example of an instance in which they do deliver the same recommended course of action. Suppose the FOMC observes an increase in available measures of inflationary pressures and a decrease in labor market slack. And what I mean by labor market slack is the gap between maximum employment and observed employment. Then many monetary policy rules would recommend the FOMC not ease policy further and in fact Given the changes of the increase in inflationary pressures, decrease in labor market slack, the FOMC should actually consider reducing the level of monetary policy accommodation. So that recommendation comes out of these rules that I talked about, but it also just makes sense. Don't ease further if you're doing better on your mandates. Yeah, that makes sense to me, at least. So with that recommendation in mind, I want to take you back to November of 2010. At that date, the FOMC took a significant policy step. It announced its intentions to buy $600 billion of longer-term Treasury securities over the next eight months through the, through the end of June. So that was in November 2010. And until August, 
the meeting in August, this was the last major step undertaken by the Federal Open Market Committee. So let me take you back to November and ask, what did the available measures of inflationary pressures and labor market slack, what might, might, one might call the mandate dashboard, look like in November? So when I think about inflation, I generally think the core inflation does a better job of tracking underlying inflationary pressures. Because core inflation, by definition, we take out volatile, we take out food and energy prices that tend to be, uh, have volatile and transitory fluctuations. Now in November of last year, PCE core inflation over the preceding 12 months had been less than 1%. That's near a, a half century low. And it had been decelerating throughout the year. Now that's what was happening at that moment in time, and a, a good mandate dashboard could also, should also include some measures of the future course of inflationary pressures. Here it's worth noting that even with the large scale asset purchases in place, FOMC participants expected core inflation to remain very low, less than 1.3% over the upcoming calendar year of 2011. Now in terms of labor market slack, it is hard, I've, I've argued this uh, in uh, other places, that it's hard to find a, key, a good, me reliable measure of this key variable. But the FOMC statement does make specific reference to the unemployment rate as a gauge of labor market slack. And so I use that measure uh, on my notional uh, mandate dashboard. So let's go back to November of 2010. In November of 2010, the unemployment rate was 9.8% with the help of the large-scale asset purchase, FOMC participants expected it to fall to about 9% a year hence. Okay, so that's what things looked like at back in November 2010 when the FOMC undertook the large-scale asset purchase, the second large-scale asset purchase. Now move forward to August 2011, last month, last month's meeting. What, how had the Dan dashboard changed? Well, first look at inflation. PCE core inflation had risen sharply. From December of 2010 through July of 2011, the annualized core PCE inflation rate was over 2%. Now, as I mentioned, um, FOMC participants submit co uh, forecasts quarterly, and unfortunately we don't have, they didn't submit forecasts of, uh, in August. So we don't have those available. But if you look at the most recent survey of professional forecasters uh, forecast, it was done before the August FOMC meeting. It predicted that core PC inflation would average 1.7% 2011, all told, and 1.6% in 2012. So it seems clear that inflationary pressures were higher in August than in November. So in August, core is running uh, over the past seven months at, a, at around at over 2%. We expect it to be um, uh, over 1.5% going forward as compared to uh, last November, when inflation was uh, running at less than 1%, we expected it to be less than 1.5% going forward. So that's on the inflation side. What about labor market slack? The unemployment rate was 9.1% in August of 2011, as opposed to 9.8% in November 2010. So again, we don't have FOMC participant projections for what was going to, they expected for unemployment going forward in, in, from August. But if you go to the survey of professional forecasters, they predict unemployment will be at 8.6%. It's just over a year's time. My own forecast for unemployment is a little more for, uh, optimistic. I don't want to uh, stress that too much. But I do expect unemployment to be under 8.5% by the end of next year. But even if we take the, the more pessimistic SPF forecast of 8.6%, labor market slack is smaller in August than it is in November. Because in, no, in November, the FOMC expected unemployment to remain around 9% in a year's time. So I'll just, you can summarize the change of the dashboard very simply. Measures of past and forecasts of future inflationary pressures were higher in August than at the time of the FOMC's last major policy move in November. Measures of current labor market slack and expectations of future labor market slack were smaller in August. The monetary policy rules that I described earlier 
would suggest don't ease further because you're doing better on your mandates. Instead, they'd recommend that the level of policy accommodation be reduced. At its August meeting, though, the FOMC decided to adopt a more accommodative policy stance. From March 2009 through June 2011, the FOMC statement said that the committee expected to keep interest rates extraordinarily low for an extended period, quote unquote. And this was generally interpreted, uh, and this is you know, just a matter of interpretation, uh, but it was generally interpreted as meaning at least for two or three meetings. So remember, the FOMC meets eight times a year, so this is somewhere between three to four and a half months, something like that. Now, in August of 2011, the FOMC changed its statement to say that it now expected to keep interest rates extraordinarily low for at least 16 meetings. So given what I've said, it's, it's not surprising that I, I chose the dissent from its decision. I would be remiss if I did not mention um, one subtlety in my discussion of changes in the mandate dashboard since November. I've treated the decline in the unemployment rate as representing a decline in labor market slack. But this view is not an uncontroversial one. From an accounting perspective, the unemployment rate can fall for one of two reasons, for two reasons, it can fall for both these reasons. People can find jobs, or people can stop searching for jobs. Much of the decline since November is attributable to people who were formerly unemployed choosing to no longer look for work. Nonetheless, it still seems appropriate to me to view this change in labor market conditions as representing a decline in labor market slack. Intuitively, people who are non-employed but are not actively looking for work are less likely to apply for any given job opening. Hence, the recent departures from the labor force imply that there is less downward pressure on wages. Almost by definition, from an economic perspective, when we think about slack, this means there's less of it, if there's less downward pressure on wages coming from the non-employed. Now, the rise in core inflation that we uh, saw in the first part of the year is consistent with this view of mine that labor market slack has fallen. Some observers would say that core PC inflation is only temporarily high because of the tragic events in Japan putting pressure on global supply chains or because of transitory spikes in commodity prices. If so, the disinflationary pressures of 2010 should soon reappear in the form of sharp decline in current expected core PC inflation rates. In that eventuality of a sufficiently strong decline in observed and expected inflation, increasing pol a policy accommodation might well be appropriate. Now, I've argued here that the committee increased the level of accommodation when standard rules seem to call for standing pat or even reducing accommodation. What are the costs of such a move? The standard rules exist as a way to guide the economy towards the committee's medium-term objective. And if monetary policy is consistently overly accommodative relative to these rules, the committee risks generating inflation higher than its objective, that is, higher than 2% for several years. As I've discussed, such an outcome could have significant consequences for inflation and inflation expectations. Future committees might have to endure large losses in employment in order to fix these consequences. Now, I mentioned that I dissented from the committee's last decision in August. Two other presidents dissented. And there have not been as many as three dissents at one FOMC meeting in nearly 20 years. So my view, this level of disagreement in the committee reflects two aspects of the current setting. The first is related to the leadership of the committee. Chairman Bernanke strongly welcomes the error of disparate views within the meeting. He clearly believes, as I do, that the United States has a, a decentralized central bank because we will get better monetary policy if decision-making is grounded in a wide range of views. And I think the chairman should be applauded for this approach to policymaking. The second issue 
that I think is generating um, the, uh, the level of disagreement within the committee is related to the nature of the economic data that we've seen in the first part of this year. I've described how inflation rose and unemployment fell. It's also true that real GDP output for the economy grew at less than 1% in an annualized rate in the first half of the year. And the outlook for real GDP growth has slipped as well. Last November, my forecast for annual real GDP growth was similar to that of other FOMC participants. I expected real GDP growth would average above 3% per year, probably closer to 3.5% per year over the next two years. That is, if you go to think about from the end of 2010 through the end of 2012. Now, you know, as we're eight months into this period, I, I expect that real GDP growth will average around 2.5% per year over that same two-year period. So instead of three, and a half, three to 3.5%, three my, my prognosis is, or forecast is for 2.5% growth. It's unusual to see an increase in inflation and a fall in unemployment both occur when GDP growth is so sluggish and when the outlook for real GDP growth has slipped as much as it has. In those, those kinds of economic circumstances, I think it's hardly surprising that there might well be some disagreement about the appropriate monetary policy response to the conflicting mix of information. So my theme in this speech has been that monetary policy must have three elements if it is to implement the price stability and maximum employment mandate successfully. The FOMC needs to formulate an objective for inflation. It needs to communicate that objective effectively. And most importantly, it needs to ensure the credibility of that communication by responding to macroeconomic conditions so as to ensure that inflation stays close to its announced objective. Losing that credibility would represent a substantial failure on the Federal Reserve's price stability mandate and would also likely lead to substantial failures on the Federal Reserve's maximum employment mandate. Despite challenging circumstances, the FOMC has succeeded on all three elements over the past three and a half years. However, as I've argued today, the committee's decision in August to make monetary policy more accommodative is inconsistent with its declared intention to keep inflation at 2% or a bit under. Now, I've described to you the nature of the FOMC's uh, uh, additional accommodation that it undertook in August. Unfortunately, the FOMC's two-year conditional commitment will be nearly impossible to undo in the near term. Uh, I think if the FOMC were to backtrack rapidly on this provision, it would significantly undercut the credibility of all forward guidance in the future. So it could never really make a promise of any kind about what it planned to do in the future without, without that promise being suspect. I take credibility very seriously, for that reason, I plan to abide by the conditional commitment of August 2011 in thinking about my own future decisions. Now, as was indicated in the recently released minutes of the August meeting, FOMC participants discussed the possibility of adopting alternative and or other forms, additional, excuse me, alternative and or additional forms of accommodation. My understanding is that this discussion will continue at our two-day September meeting. In a speech last week in Bismarck, North Dakota, I said that I believe that any additional provision of accommodation in September or thereafter will have to be judged on its own merits. So some readers or listeners may have, may have found this statement to be imprecise. So let me elaborate on what I meant then and continue to believe. I assess FOMC actions in light of the incoming data and the committee's communicated objective of keeping inflation at 2% or a bit under. With that in mind, the data in August did not justify the additional accommodation provided at that meeting. It is unlikely, in my view, that the data in September will warrant adding still more accommodation. So I managed to wrap up before you all started rattling your notebooks, which uh, I wasn't always able to do as a teacher, I have to admit. Uh, but um, thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions at this point.